Father, as we come to Thee, we thank Thee, Lord, that Thou art greater than all our need. We pray for Thy direction in this, in this meeting, in this session. Guide us, give us clear understanding. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. If you have your Bible, I want you to open it, if you would, please, to the Gospel according to John, chapter 17. Now, this is the high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we come to one verse here that I want to call your attention to. But we'll begin with verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he would give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. I want you to notice in the fourth verse, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And I want you to circle uh, the word thou, would you please? Circle it. This is the secret, discovering the secret of obedience to God. Now one thing builds on another and we're trying to remember that Satan comes disguised as an angel of light. And this is all to misdirect the Christian life. <clears throat> to misdirect the Christian life. It's like the fellow who said, I, I've climbed the ladder of success only to find out it was leaned against the wrong building. Made all the effort, <clears throat> did everything I could possibly do, but for the wrong goal to be achieved. And Satan can so work the thing so that we get a, a mistaken impression even of duty. And a lot of people have that that mistaken impression of, of our Christian duty it becomes a guilt trip. The servant has one responsibility, and that is to do what his master has given him to do. I'd like to say a thousand times, the servant's responsibility is not to serve, it is to obey. You need to know who your master is. Many people spend their lives trying to master others, but we need to spend our lives allowing God to master us. One of the worst things that come down the line is what is called commonly servant leadership. Someone in the business world came up with that idea in the 70s and lots of people picked it up. And <clears throat> what, what it transforms itself and morphs into is the more you do, the more valuable you are. If you want to be valuable, you have to stay as busy as possible. And you can never finish anything. The Lord Jesus could never have been considered a success, even though He said He finished the work which He was given to do. <clears throat> he never did enough. There are people who rejected Him. It's so twisted and so misleading. When Paul writes about the Lord's service, he writes to Titus about things to set in order and things to avoid. The scripture references in Titus chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause I left thee, left I thee in Crete, that thou should have set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. These are leaders who would be led by the Lord, these elders. But he said to set in order. <clears throat> there are things that we're to set in order. Where do we get the order? What is the fixed point of reference for the Christian? It's the Word of God. There's a certain order, an orderly way about doing things. To avoid, this is a faithful saying, these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they, may, that they which have believed in God 
might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men, but avoid, and he gives a list, avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Now, <clears throat> I want us to take the time to turn back in our notes to a little chart at the end of the lesson we gave on our vision of God. And I want to show you something. There's a little chart at the very end. In your notes, it is on page 51. There is the man of vision versus the man of ambition. Vision begins with God as God reveals himself to us. And I want to inject this in our, our study here about obedience and the secret of obedience to God. The biblical leader versus the pragmatist. The biblical leader begins with God. This is what the Lord's assigned me to do. The pragmatist begins with man. You might even read of a survey done by the people at the Saddleback Church and they surveyed the community to find out what the community needed and wanted and what they would like to see in a church and, and what was done in that work and it has had an amazing success as we use the word success, trying to fulfill the requirements that the people had so the church might be whatever it may be. And the whole purpose-driven movement came out of that. It began with man. The biblical leader versus the pragmatist. <clears throat> the biblical leader does a work of faith. The pragmatist does a work of sight. The biblical leader believes if it is right, God will bless it. The pragmatist, the man of ambition, believes if it works, it must be right. The biblical leader says, is, is this obedience to God? This is what we're doing. He is obedient to God. The pragmatist is in competition with others. His standard of success is not in obedience to God, but if he can accomplish more than someone else has accomplished. The biblical leader desires God be glorified. The pragmatist is constantly seeking the approval of man. The biblical leader is Christ-centered. The pragmatist is man-centered. The biblical leader serves God. The pragmatist serves self. The biblical leader lives a life of simplicity and godly sincerity. The pragmatist, the man of ambition, lives a life of complexity. These are two totally different ways to live your life. And may I say, sadly, sad to say, the way some people approach ministry. Now, how are we to minister? What is the secret of obedience to God? Most of the time, back here to what we're talking about, setting an order and avoiding, we set in order the things we're to avoid and we avoid the things we're to set in order. How do we know the difference? What is it you want to do? I hope it's to please the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ provides us with the example of obedience. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He yielded. What is the responsibility of the servant? This is not about servant leadership. It's not about how much you can get done. You'll learn this lesson when you're incapacitated. Have you ever been that way? Have you ever gotten to the place where you're not physically capable of doing what you think the minister should do? Do you think you might ever get that way? Now, I don't want you to rely upon my experiences. I want you to rely upon the Lord and His Word. But let me give my experience for a moment. I discovered that I had something wrong with my back 
I couldn't function. And I went to get x-rays, having trouble moving, walking, could walk maybe 10 steps and then had to sit down. I went to get the x-rays and the x-ray technician said, I could lose my job if somebody knew what I'm doing. But he said, I, I tell you, sir, I've never seen anything as bad as your back. I was referred to a neurologist, went to his office, and he said, I, I'm going to tell you, this neurological surgeon said, uh, you're disabled, and you'll be disabled the rest of your life. I can operate on you, but I'll have to put you in a body cast, and you'll have to learn to walk all over again. He said, if I had seen your x-rays before I saw you, I would say, this man is somewhere in an emergency room, and he's paralyzed. There's such pressure on your spinal cord from this severe stenosis. And it's all up and down your spine. What do you do for a living? I said, I'm a minister of the gospel, a Baptist preacher. He said, you're finished. You'll have to live on so many powerful drugs just for pain. You won't be able to function. Now, this is 17 years ago. My mother was dying of cancer and I told the doctor he scheduled the surgery. I said, I can't have the surgery. I've got to go be with my mother until she dies. I'm the oldest of four children. She's counting on me. In the meantime, I found a, a different surgeon at a spine institute in Louisville, Kentucky, an orthopedic surgeon who operates with a, a neurological man. And I had the first of five surgeries, the last one they replaced my neck with a metal cage. Walking, I've had more pain in the last two months than I've had in 17 years. Every day I'm living on a, you know, on the mercy of God. I don't take pain medicine. I do take every once in a while a Tylenol or something like that or two aspirin. I'm allergic to pain medicine. And I, I live in a measure of discomfort. And um, that's part of it. I've come to believe that it's a gift from God. But what do you do when you're, when you're full of dreams and ideas and want to serve the Lord and you've got every kind of thing imaginable in your mind to do for God and you think, I don't have the physical body to do it? Cannot do it. My idea was that if you really want to do something great for God, you have to be like a decathlon athlete. They're the people who really get it done. There's no limit to what they can get done and how long they can go. I actually thought it was a spiritual thing to run as fast and long and hard as I possibly could. I prided myself in being able to take my two sons and beat any other three people at anything they wanted to play. And we did that for years, years, until I was well into my 40s, for years. But I started dealing with a different thing, a totally different thing. And I had to reevaluate some things. I've worked, I think, harder, studied more than ever. But I realized that my value to God was not in my ability. And I realized that my value to God as a servant of the Lord was not in what I could do in service, but in absolute obedience to Him. And I came to the conclusion that there's one thing God requires of anyone who wants to serve Him, and that is obedience. Dr. Frank Sells taught us that obedience is not just doing God's will, it is delighting in doing God's will. So you ought to write that down. There are many people who are doing God's will, but they're not delighting in it. How do we delight in doing God's will? It has everything to do, not something, but everything to do with who we're serving, to whom we offer this service. Now, I do things because of my grandchildren. I want them to have a future. I do things because of my children. I do things because of my wife. I adore my wife, and she knows it, and everybody else knows it. And I think she adores me. Ask her, I hope. Find her in a good mood, please. And don't tell me if she says anything but a wholehearted yes. I can't bear to hear it. I'm having a little fun with you now. 
But why do we do what we do? Why do we do what we do? I want to please people. I want to please those I love and love me. But what is the secret of obedience to God? What is the secret? It's doing it for Him and not for them. Doing it for Him and not for them. For them. I pastor a church and I never could make everybody happy. Now I'm going to say something that's going to shock the life out of you. And I don't mean this in any way as a derogatory comment. But there'd be some people happy today who say they love me, who'd be happy today if they had another pastor. They'd be happy today. They'd think, well, we'll give this one a shot too. It's not that they don't care for me. They love me. They just think it'd be fun to try somebody else. And every time I've had one of these spine surgeries, I've had some very kind, gracious, loving, caring, devoted members who said, have you got your pastor picked out for us before you go to the hospital? You know, you could die. And I've said, thank you. But you more likely will die before I get back. You know? Um, I'm just telling you, once you get caught in that cycle of having to prove to people and do for people, it is an unending rat race. It really is. It's back to the beginning. Can you even remember when you did what you did for the Lord? Can you even remember what that was like when God gave you an opportunity to preach or God entrusted you with the opportunity to take the gospel to people? Can you even remember what it was like about how excited you were the first time any door of opportunity opened. You didn't think about how many people were there, or how long you'd get to do this. You just praised God for it. It wasn't just because it was new. It was because Christ meant everything to you. That's what I'm dealing with. And the Lord worked in my life. He, he got the quickest way possible to my heart by touching my body. And getting my attention. Now, I spend my life in ministry trying to discern what I am to set in order and what I am to avoid. Many preachers have spent their lives setting in order things they should have avoided and made a mess of things avoiding what they should have set in order. There's no doubt about it. I want to give you some statements, just some short declarations. And I, I think we could elaborate on them. We may elaborate a little bit. But this is one of the transforming things for me. It truly is. Is that my responsibility to God is the responsibility of obedience. Obedience to Him. To Him. So let's look at a few things. The Lord Jesus provides us with the example of obedience, yielding, yielding. We must have the mind of Christ in order to discern between what we're to set in order and what we're to avoid. He said in John 8, 29, And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. That's the secret. I have an audience of one. Would you write that in your notes? I have an audience of one. And that one is the Lord. Now, I'm the boss around here. Interesting. My oldest grandson said to me one time, he's just a little guy, he came up to one of the pencils in the rack of the pews and he said, who's the boss of this church? I said, uh, what'd you say, son? Uh, he said, I said, Papa, who's the boss of this church? I said, well, I don't think we have one. He said, everything has a boss. Who's the boss of this church? And I said, well, I don't know. He said, well, I need to know who the boss of this church is. I said, well, I'm the pastor. You know that. He said, was well, that the boss? I said, well, not really the boss. But he said, what I'm trying to get to, I want this pencil. <laughs> and I need to ask someone, can I have it? Yeah. I said, you can have it. You can have it. Look, the Lord's the boss. 
Please him, please him, please him, please him, please him. And his commandments are not grievous. And pleasing him should be our greatest delight. I want you to remember this. You ought to make this a quote you use and use it often. We do not lead by serving. We lead by obeying. We lead by obeying. I was giving a thought like this at a meeting where there were some people there from other places coming to spy out the land. And one of them came up to me after it was over and said, I think that's the most foolish thing I've ever heard in my life. And I said, I thought you would. I thought you would. Because it is against everything in our human nature. It truly is. In our human nature, we count our worth by who's following us. Instead of, are we following the Lord? I've glorified thee on the earth. I've finished the work which thou gavest me to do. The Lord did not develop a plan or cast a vision. How often have we heard that? He obeyed his Father's will. Somebody said, I want you to go back to your church and cast a vision. Make it a great vision. I need to get the gestures right. Make it a great vision. Well, good. I got a plan for you. What's wrong with finding out what God wants us to do and saying, will you pray with me and I'll pray with you and let's pray that we'll do what the Lord's given us to do. And here it is spelled out clearly in the Bible. Amen. And everybody can get on board. Amen. You say, well, I, I think the best way to lead, lead this church is to meet, grab a hold of the whole thing, grab the influence and give it direction. That's true. You can do that. Or you can teach people how to get a hold of God and pray and find Find what the Lord wants to do. And if you really got the word from God that you should have had and you're going in a direction, don't you think the same Holy Spirit will speak to them and say, I believe this is the right thing. Follow, follow, follow. That's a whole lot better than you drag them along kicking and screaming, isn't it? May God guide us. He leadeth me. The Lord did not develop a plan or cast a vision. He obeyed His Father's will. He leadeth me. I want you to write this down, please. There's a tyranny in the self-life. There's a tyranny in the self-life. If you make him the master, he's not kind. That leads me to say the people are not the master. The Lord is the master. So if any man serve me, let him follow me. Where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Jesus said that in John 12, 26. And I read it with that certain emphasis so that I hope you get the point. The people are not the master. They want to be the master. Which is, which is worse? The people wanting to be the master or some man wanting to be the master of the people? I don't want either one of them. I don't want either one of them. But there are people sitting in your congregation who want to be the master and they want you to please them to the point of you being afraid you won't please them. And the fear of man is a snare. The secret of obedience and service to the Lord is we're doing this for the Lord. It's obedience to God. God help us. Making service the goal leads to the idea that we can never do enough. I know we had a great day, but I'm not happy about it. I could take you today to a lady if I could find her. Beautiful woman who was married to a pastor. Who raised two sons, both into their 20s, and fed, said to the pastor, her husband, I'm leaving today and I'm not coming back. You've never been happy one day in your life as a pastor. 
Your sons have never seen happiness in your life. Your home has never seen happiness. Nothing's ever been good enough, big enough, well enough, nothing. And I've had all of it I can have. Can't take any more. And she left. And to my knowledge, she's never come back. Now, when you make service the goal, how much of it do you have to do? It becomes a tyrant. Now, don't miss the point. We will do more because of what Christ has done for us than we will ever do trying to get things from Christ for what we do. But we've got to get the Lord in the beginning. He's always previous. Oh, may God help us. I, I see so many unhappy people, and I've been too unhappy at times myself, trying to make service the goal. What can I get done? What do we get done? There is, there is a sweet peace and a release in having given one's best to Christ, leaving the results in the hands of God. Paul said, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20, 24. We are to be the servants of God and God will give us what He wants us to do. Now think of this. We are to be the servants of God and God will give us what He wants us to do. Somewhere on that blank page on the left-hand side, I want you to write this down. I want you to put a big star by it, would you please? There are those who allow God to use them, and there are those who use God. They allow the Lord to use them, and there are those who attempt to use God. We're to be the servants of God, and God will give us what He wants us to do. What is it the Lord has for us to do? People say to me, uh, have you come up with something else? No. No, I'm trying to do one thing. One thing? I thought you were doing a hundred things. I'm trying to do one thing, and that's do what God leads me to do. My theme is training other people, able to teach others also. And I want to... I want to get as many people trained as I can before I meet the Lord. That's a passion I have. I believe God gave it to me. It's an assignment I've been given from the Lord. It's very important that we get this. He said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you. Would you underline that? I will make you. I will make you. It's obvious if we're not fishing for men, we're not following the Lord because if we're not following the Lord, we don't fish for men. But if we follow the Lord, He will make us fishers of men. If we're not fishers of men, then somewhere along the line, we've ceased to follow the Lord because He will make us fishers of men. And I'd like to summarize all of this with this statement. God's work is not to advance our work. Our work is to advance God's work. God's work is not to advance our work. There are many ambitious people in the ministry. Don't be one of them. And these men are driving their wives crazy and their kids crazy and everybody else crazy. It's never good enough. Never enough. Never good enough. Never big enough. Never recognized enough. Never appreciated enough. Whose approval do you seek? You can have the Lord's approval by obeying Him. Is it, is it true that if we obey Him, He gives the blessing? He gives the increase? We act as if it's our increase, you know? We gave the increase. Why don't you just pray in your own name? Seriously. But if we ask anything in His name, He'll hear us. Why? It's about Him and His glory. 
and you say, well, I need some people to get done what I want done and I want them to help me get done what I want to get done. Well, that's not the approach to take. And then you want to scold the people for not doing what you want done. No, it shouldn't be done that way. If you're not the religious boss, no, no. As a matter of fact, if you're doing what God wants you to do, you, you couldn't be paid to do it. They ought to pay you. They ought to take care of you, not because you're, you're being weighed out that way. I tell our people, uh, don't, don't, don't pay me to do what I'm doing. You couldn't do that. What do you want to do? When I preach a good sermon, that's $39.95. And when I preach a flop and lay an egg, it's $9.95. Or when I make a hospital call at somebody you love, that's $19.50. And if it's somebody you don't know, maybe it's just $8.50. Is that, is that what we're about here? You don't pay the pastor because of what he's doing. You pay the pastor so he can be free to do what God's given him to do. Amen. If you don't trust him, don't, don't, don't ask him to be the pastor. But churches have to be taught these things. Bring it all up to the level where it ought to be. I want to follow the Lord. I want to be obedient to God. I want to do what the Lord wants me to do. And by the way, don't start using God to qualify what you're doing, what you want to get done. The easiest thing in the world is to say, well, this is God's will. I just know it's God's will. Don't you people fear the Lord? You know? Don't you people fear the Lord? I, I always get a little suspicious when the preacher changes the way he talks, you know, to, to do God's work. God's work is not to advance our work. God does not work for me. I work for Him. God's work is not to advance our work. Our work is to advance God's work. So what is the secret to obedience? What is the secret to obedience? What's the secret to getting your people to do things? What is it? What's the application here? To bring them to the point where they're doing what they do for whom? For, for God. And the greatest promotion for that is that they see you're doing what you do for the Lord. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Let's pray together, may we? Father, guide us and help us now. May we be used of Thee. May we please Thee. We can please Thee, Lord, by obeying Thee. Deliver us from these foolish ideas that are concocted in our egos. And help us, Jesus. In thy name we pray, amen.